hospitality in this video will discuss the qualitative and quantitative EDS. Whenever doing EDS, you need to have a few things in mind. The first is you need to ensure you have enough counts. You have seen a similar example before. When the acquisition time is too short, you don't see the manganese K alpha peak. As you increase the acquisition time, the manganese K alpha peak becomes more prominent. The takeaway message is if you do not have enough counts, you may miss some information you're looking for. When doing peak identifications, you need to bear a few things in mind. The first is to be aware of the artifacts. We have spent an entire video on that, so we will not expand it here in this video. The second thing is look for groups of peaks. Starting from the L shell, you have subshells with slightly different energies. In EDS, it is reflected by the groups of peaks. In the example shown in the middle, you can see when you look at the calcium peaks, you have the calcium K alpha and the calcium K beta. Similarly, in iron and the copper, you have the iron K alpha, iron K beta, and the copper K alpha, copper K beta. For example, if you see a peak in the position of calcium K beta, but there's no calcium K alpha peak, most likely this peak is from an artifact. The third thing is when you don't see a peak, it doesn't mean it's not there. It is especially important in X-ray peaks less than 1 keV. With X-ray energy less than 1 keV, you have the K X-rays from light elements, such as carbon and oxygen, and L X-rays from the transition metals. In the example shown on the right, the chromium peak is convoluted by the oxygen peak. Nowadays, the EDS softwares offer auto-peak ID. By clicking that button, the computer will tell you what elements you have in the material. However, as a microscopist, you should understand what you are looking at in the EDS spectra and do not fully rely on the computer. For the elemental quantification from EDS, we can apply the same philosophy. A layman may just hit the quantify button and write down some numbers, but you should understand what happened behind the scenes. To perform quantification, the first thing to do is to remove the background. Remember in EDS, you have the characteristic X-ray peaks on top of the continuum Bremsstrahlung X-ray background. The first approach to remove the background is very easy. You just draw a box to represent the background. Then you use the entire intensity minus the background to get the actual intensity. In the second approach, you draw two boxes, one before the peak, the other after the peak. You take the average and it will be the background. You use the total intensity, subtract the background to get the actual intensity. In the last approach, you can actually calculate the background using Kramer's law. In fact, many modern EDS softwares use this approach to subtract backgrounds. Moving forward, when doing EDS quantification, there are three things we need to consider. It's called ZAF. Z represents the atomic number. A is the absorption of X-rays. F is the fluorescence of X-rays. Let's look at the effect of Z first. Recall when we discussed the inelastic scattering in TEM, we learned that the fluence or the generation of characteristics X-ray is directly related to the atomic number Z. Under the same condition, a higher Z element will give off more counts of the characteristic X-rays. Using the nickel oxide as an example, the atomic ratio is 1 to 1. However, by looking at the intensity or counts of X-rays alone, we'll have a lot more nickel counts than the oxygen counts. Note, in this graph, the y-axis is in log scale. To take the z effect into account, there are two approaches. The first approach is called the cliff lorimer ratio technique, also called the k-factor technique. Assuming the sample's thin enough, so there's no significant amount of absorption and fluorescence. Looking at a binary system made from A and B, CA over CB is equal to KAB multiplied by IA over IB. 
Here, C is the concentration. It is in wave percent by convention. I is the peak intensity from EDS. KAB is the K factor. You can also extend it into a ternary system. The same relationship holds. Notice that in the binary system, there is only one K factor, KAB. However, in the ternary system, you have three K factors, KAB, KAC, and the KBC. To obtain the K factor values, you can experimentally measure that with a specimen of a known composition. This is in fact how you calibrate your EDS detector. Also, you can calculate the K factors. In this equation, A is the atomic weight, Q is the ionization cross-section or ionization probability, omega is the fluorescence yield, A is the relative transition probability, and epsilon is the detector efficiency. These parameters are highly sensitive to the instrument you choose and the specimen you use. The second approach to correct Z is the zeta factor method. This is the equation to calculate zeta, and the only new parameter is I, the current, which you can measure using a Faraday cup. NO is the Avogadro's number. For binary systems, you can write down the relationship of the, the composition of each element and the intensity in the EDS spectra. Using the zeta factor approach, in many cases, is advantageous compared to the k factor approach. This is because in k factors, the value is not element specific. It depends on which element you're compared to. But for zeta factor, it is element specific. Each element has its own zeta factor, regardless what else elements are present in the system. Next, we'll briefly discuss the A correction. Absorption will happen when the specimen is too thick. Given the thickness of the specimen, X-rays with lower energy are more likely to be absorbed by the specimen. These X-rays are usually generated by low Z elements and are called soft X-ray. Also, if you have two elements with drastically different characteristics X-ray energies, the X-ray coming from the low Z element is likely to be absorbed by the high Z element. This slide shows the A correction for both the K factor approach and the zeta factor approach. I will not go through the details of the mathematics. The last one is F correction. Fluorescence happens when a high energy X-ray is getting absorbed by the system and excites a low energy X-ray. However, because the chance of absorbing a high energy X-ray is pretty low, so in many cases we don't have to worry about the fluorescence correction. By the end of this video, I hope peak identification and the peak quantification in EDS is not a black box to you anymore. In the next video, we'll talk about the EDS spatial resolution and the detection limit in TEM.